Well, Chris, thanks for having me and, and nice to see you all. Um, so the Government Finance Officers Association, we're technically the Government Finance Officers Association of the United States and Canada, uh, but we just go GFA for short. Uh, we are a, a national organization that essentially represents the public finance officers, as Chris already mentioned, mostly at the local level, uh, but we do have a smattering of, of state, uh, state officials. Right now, we're an organization that has about 21,000 members, um, close to 50% of that membership are from cities, towns, and villages. Uh, probably just over 20% of that membership are from counties. And then we actually have uh, about 17% that are from special districts, so utility districts, school districts. Uh, and then the rest, of course, are the state, um, uh, state agencies uh, and the like. Now, our main mission at GFOA is to be a resource, an educator, a facilitator, and an advocate for our public finance officers. And a lot of those roles are uh, come out of our national headquarters in Chicago, but I am in our smaller office in Washington, D.C., the Federal Liaison Center. Uh, the Federal Liaison Center, we have a couple of buckets that we focus on. Uh, no surprise, of course, congressional advocacy and advocacy with the administration. Uh, but one of the other things that we do out of the FLC for short is we help manage our standing committee. Uh, our standing committees, we have seven of them that focus on different buckets or areas or topics for public finance. Um, and these are the groups that essentially do the bulk of the work developing our best practices and advisories. Um, best way to kind of think about it, best practices, as some of you have probably seen best practices in all kinds of areas. Uh, these are like affirmative practices that we, uh, basically say are kind of the industry standard for public finance officers on things where there's budgeting, uh, pensions, capital planning, uh, debt management, you name it. And then we have advisories, which are what we like to think are mostly cautionary statements, um, but they're meant to serve as a stop and review for governments. Um, and then we actually do have a third bucket, which are our policy statements, but those are really broad general positions of organizations on issues. So things like you know, tax reform, whatnot, that's behind our policy statements. Um, our best practices are, uh, and I'll share it in a moment here on, on my screen, but our best practices um, go through a process I won't say every year, but um, for the most part, committees are kind of doing this on an ongoing basis because it kind of depends on uh, where industry practices may be going um, and what things may be up that our members are hearing as they're trying to do their day-to-day -day, uh, job. So really, um, like I said, it starts in the committees. Uh, these, each committee will essentially follow a, form a smaller work uh, that'll do things like research the topic, even have a couple of calls where they'll have some consultants or other experts on, in the area, you know, talk to them and then try to wrap their head around on, on what they're they're hearing and then how they can apply that to what they do on a day-to-day -day basis. And they're the ones who will end, it, end up, uh, you know, taking a cut at the first draft. Um, it'll go to the full committees for debate. Um, and you know, best practices, it's not like, you know, they, they can draft them and once the committee considers them, they're, they're approved on, a, on the first go. Uh, a lot of them will go back to the drawing board, especially if other members of the committee are either unclear or not comfortable with how some of the, the language within the best practice is worded. Um, and even if they're, they get to the point where they're approved by the, the, the full committee, uh, the board has to approve those e uh, as well um, at either our March or September meeting. Um, that's actually one of the reasons uh, why some of our folks could, some of our other folks at GFA could make it today because our board is actually today for their March meeting. They're actually looking at a couple of advisories and best practices for approval. Um, as far as how often we take a look at these, uh, we update them um, periodically. It's, each committee kind of depends on um, how often they'll read their, their statements. Uh, but for example, the committee I staff, we actually have a goal of trying to review our large bucket of, of best practices and advisories every five years. Um, do we always hit that mark? And maybe not, but you know, that's a goal of ours to try to look at every five years just to make sure something hasn't changed. Um, 
So for an example, you know, one that actually the board is considered today is an advisory that some folks in my committee helped draft together and recently uh, was an advisory against uh, high asset transfer protections. Um, that's an uh, idea that's been floated around, of course, probably seen discussions about um, the current fiscal challenges that some pension systems are facing, public pension systems are facing. And so there's a, always a, you know, a plethora of ideas of how you can try to address some of these unfunded liabilities. So we try to weigh in on things and, and that's kind of the goal of advisories and best practices. Um, so let me just stop there for a second share my screen just so I can so you can see where you can find this. So if you go to www.gfloa.org, um, this is essentially where you can go uh, if you go to the home page. Um, we have a, you know, like anything else, we have a drop down menu where you can look uh, at the different. Michael, you're not sharing it if you're, if you're trying to. Oh, really? Okay. Yeah. Sorry, share. Now am I sharing? Yeah, now you are. All right, there we go. So you go to our homepage, um, and you'll see across the top here our best practices. Well, you can also look at membership profile of our membership. See if you are on our standing committees. Um, as I mentioned, we have six. Well, technically seven standing committees. One is primarily focused on committee issues, so somewhat of a different uh, bucket as far as what they try to work on. Uh, and then you can go over here to our best practice. Here's where you'll get to the heart of, of all the things that um, each committee will try to work on. Uh, you'll see the categories of the best practices, budgeting, debt management. Those are probably the ones that have gotten a little more attention recently, of course, and all throughout the Great Recession. Uh, I'm going to point to the ones in my committee, of course, because that's the one, those are the ones I'm more familiar with. So you'll see here, you, uh, even within the categories, they're subdivided by topic. Um, so like there's governance and management. Um, we do have different buckets for DCs and DC plans. Um, and then you'll see as you scroll down the topic you want to go into, the ones in blue are the actual best practices. And, and if there are any advisors in there, you'll see those in yellow. It's part of the reason why we put it in yellow. As I mentioned before, advisory is supposed to be like that stop and uh, slow down of the governments as far as practices. So one that has recently, uh, we've gotten a couple of calls on, especially throughout last year, um, what was on pension obligation bonds, That's something that has been coming up more frequently, of course, because of the favorable interest rate environment. There are some so it's a good idea um, to issue that how low um, we we'll try to extinguish some of that. That's it. Um, Michael, if I could stop you one sure, second. Sure, yeah. You, you're cutting out a bit. I was wondering if you oh. maybe have your microphone up in front of you instead of. OK, uh, sorry about that. Is that any better? I could always switch to the front too if I need to. Seems to be a little better. I guess maybe keep it up front. So sorry to interrupt. OK, no, no, that's fine. Please let me know if, if, if I'm. Uh, so yeah, so just wanted to fit. Um, Finish that real quick. Uh, as far as you know, the advisories you'll see those in yellow. Again, that's you know the stop and for governments when it comes to certain things that we're seeing in the industry that are either being, uh, I would say, either suggested or proposed by consultants or what have you. Any of the folks that officials may or finance officials may face. And then the last thing I'll touch on real quick. It's just some of the other resources aside from our best practices uh, that we have up here. One of the things that we do try to do is we'll try to take some of the complex finance issues when it comes to public finance, and we try to explain it in a way that a non-finance person can try to understand. So um, we do a number of things. So I, I pulled up the advance for funding bonds. Uh, we've tried to put together like reports that try to explain it in the Part of what we try to do this as well is we do engage uh, Hill staff on this, who of course may not always have a finance background. So we try to put together a couple of whiteboard videos here and there um, together, uh, advanced refund myth buster, again, just to try to explain some of these complex finance topics in a, in a much more simple way that really tries to stay away from 
to the weeds. And if you ever need someone to get to the weeds, then you can always uh, call or contact any of the members on those standing committees. And you'll see we have our rosters on the website as well. And you can see where they're from, uh, what their title is, because of course, for finance officers, uh, their titles can range anywhere from finance director, budget director, uh, they can be a deputy administrator. So you know that they all wear different hats and have different titles, but essentially related to some some way to its function. So uh, I was really just going to end with that as far as showing who was on our committees and how you can figure out um, uh, who you may be interested in calling, depending on the topic area. And you know, depending on what you're covering and the best practices that the committee that may have been responsible for that. So I'll just stop there and open it up to any questions. Okay, so uh, so we got about 15 minutes for Q and A. Um, anybody have a question to go first? Well, let me ask. Let me ask a question, Mike. The um, the 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 best practices that you have. I mean. How are they? How are those deployed and employed by other, or, you know, by organizations? Do they become part of, you know, if a if a city or a state is is you know trying to push its its um, finance officers to do something? Do they do they call out your best practices and say, here here's what you should be doing? Do you become fodder in a political debate? Uh, yeah, that's actually a good way to put it. Become fodder, but that's you know really what it. Be, as far as our members go, uh, they do look at the best practices as a way whenever, you know, their officials are trying to push for an idea and they say, look, you know, that's not what's recommended by GFOA best practices. So we probably need to think of an alternative or figure out a different way to try to approach the issue. Um, you know, whether it's, you know, obviously it, it can be, it's, it's going to be up to those, you know, the, what is the County Commission or the City Council will be up to them as far as making the decision. But the whole goal of having the best practices is for the, at least to equip the finance officer you know, when they're making those recommendations or when they're getting those questions during those budget hearings um, or when they're you know, even trying to make a decision on whether to issue debt or not. Uh, this is what they can turn to and use as the guardrails. Okay. Uh, yeah. So I got a question from uh, uh, Laura. Yeah, hi, I'm Laura Bischoff. I work for the Dayton Daily News in our Columbus office in Ohio. I had a question about public pensions. Um, you know, a lot of systems across the country were, you know, grossly underfunded and, and with a failure to make regular contributions. Um, and that put a lot of pressure on systems to um, kind of go with private equity, hedge funds, real estate, kind of these alternative, um, less traditional assets. Um, is there guidance? Do you guys have guidance in terms of uh, asking uh, pension systems to, or giving guidance to pension systems on limiting that kind of alternative investment, um, the amount it should be in their asset allocation? I, I mean, we do. So we do have an investment, an investment funding guideline. Uh, that's a best practice. That we, I don't know off the top of my head if there's certain categories that we say to have limits, but we do have a, a best practice on that. Um, and I'm trying to remember, I can take a look to see when that was actually last reviewed, uh, but that's something that, you know, there is a guidance or there is a best practice that's out there. I mean, the one caveat that we do know is that although we have the best practices out there, um, or even advisories, you know, as much as we'd like to think that uh, we have an advisor out there, so, you know, that's going to keep everyone from doing whatever it is we were recommending they not do, uh, but there's always going to be, you know, one or two decide to just move forward anyway. But as far as the investment, um, I mean, there, there is a, a best practice. And, yeah. Do you guys also have a recommendation on like a, a number of the pension systems in Ohio have reduced their actual actuarial rate of returns, um, which then causes their unfunded liabilities to balloon. So <clears throat> does, does your organization recommend lowering that, that anticipated rate of return? Um, off the top of my head, we don't have a recommendation on whether they should lower that or not. I mean, I know we have, um, as far as like the governance guidelines, uh, but they and, and you know there are there are certain things that we will speak or have a clear position or not position, but a clear statement on. 
in our best practices. But uh, as far as I know, we don't uh, we don't get that far as far as what they should be. Um, that that be. and I know that's I, that's the discussion that has come up uh, a lot, especially in recent years. Um, I would say. Um, I would probably have to talk to, uh, or I would either recommend talking to folks like the state retirement administrators uh, as far as that industry practice that. And now again, that's something else that, that's being discussed quite frequently. Okay. And I know some have even faced a lot of criticism as well as far as what they've done, so. Thank you. All right, so we're gonna go to Jill, Samantha, Stephen Caruso, and Lauren. Uh, Jill first. Uh, I'm Jill Amit. I'm a producer and a reporter for a statewide public radio program uh, called the Texas Standard in Austin. Um, I guess I cover a lot. Uh, well, a good bit of what I recover in reporting or just in producing too is um, school finance formulas. Um, and I see that y'all have like um, like a school budgeting uh, uh, spiel on your website, but I'm just wondering like maybe you're not the best person to talk to about this, but um, if you could direct me to somebody who could kind of, really what I'm trying to uh, figure out right now is uh, why some why some states, Texas funds its school per attendance. Um, and it's one of really just like a handful of states that still do that. While a lot of the other states fund the uh, school districts through enrollment. Um, and I think the pandemics might change that a bit in the state because Obviously, attendance is a is a huge issue in Texas right now, and the large large school districts. And so, uh, a lot of what I'm wondering is like, will the state uh, consider an enrollment style formula? But if there are comparisons that can be made between the two, okay. so uh, I am not the best person to talk to. But Matt Bubness is our staff person who handles our alliance for school budgeting, but um, that's also something that they've been working to build out recently. I mean, there was, um, it's uh, when it first started, it was kind of a loose network of some of the school business officials and budgeting officers that were coming to our conferences. And um, to your point, as far as like, you know, trying to do some comparison, that's kind of all, how it all started. Uh, they were just trying to have some discussions on what they were doing with their respective school district. But Matt Bubness would be the best one to talk to you about that. Okay, up next is Samantha. Can't hear you. Can you hear me? Yeah. Oh, actually, we can't hear you. This um, bad static. Oh, Let me tell you. Let, um, okay. see if you can... I, I can hear you. Is this a, is this okay? Now you can. Yes. Yes. Okay, great. Sorry about that. Um, right. Yeah. I have a question. If you're seeing any patterns about uh, defunding movements. Um, I know that there's been a lot of pushes in different states to defund pension plans from fossil fuels and uh, prisons, for example, sort of like social justice <laughs> type of um, strategies. And I'm curious what you've been seeing and how the pandemic has affected that. So uh, that's, that's a good question. And that is something that I feel like, at least with the pension investment officers, I know that is, I mean, as far as I know, it's a discussion that is happening. We don't have, at least on the committee, we have mostly like the executive directors of the pension funds, not necessarily investment officers, but I know that's something uh, that they've raised. I can look back in our notes to see how much, I, I don't know what that that trend is as far as funding um, from what pensions are actually investing in. But um, we, I, I wanna say at the last meeting that we had uh, in January, um, I, I mean, there was only a little discussion that that some folks had during our round table. But I wish I had a number as far as what that's potentially looking like right now, but I, I don't know. Um, I could also, I would also point you to as well, uh, that group I mentioned earlier, NASRA, the National Social State Retirement Administrators. Th those are just the state folks or state plans, of course, but uh, they may have some numbers as far as you know, what that trend is now. Um, or even the National Institute of uh, 
retirement security nurse, I think is another group that, that kind of takes a, a broad look um, at some of the pension data as far as what they're getting. Could you repeat the second? Um, uh, I think, uh, yeah, National Institute of Retirement Security. Oh, we call them NERS for short, but um, yeah, National Institute on Retirement Security. So they're NERSonline.org. They do a lot of, a lot of good research. Okay, um, Stephen Caruso. Hi, uh, my name's Stephen. I cover uh, uh, Harrisburg for the Pennsylvania Capital Star. Just a quick question. Um, do you have, uh, or does your group also have best practices on the use of one-time uh, revenues, like uh, when they should be used, when you might be overusing one-timers? Just sort of curious. Uh, that would probably fall into like our, um, I would imagine probably like our budgeting best practices. I, I know we kind of, I guess when you say one-timer revenues, uh, so like a rainy day or no i mean well like uh, i guess like what i'm thinking about from pennsylvania's perspective we've kind of had the past three or four or five budgets uh just expanded gambling bit by bit uh like borrowed money out of uh like the tobacco settlement and like securitized it uh like borrowed money against assets and like kind of consistently done this to meet like a structural deficit that we've had for the past like three or four or five years i don't know if you have any like that's something that uh, your organization has ever like looked into on a broader basis like how i'm trying to figure out how normal or abnormal this is for our state i suppose gotcha um that's a good question i have to look at that i, I don't if we do have something I, I don't know that we would call it like kind of like one time or revenue kind of type. I think that's kind of what you're getting at um i'd have to I, I don't know that we actually would or i honestly just don't know off the top of my head if that our budgeting best practices uh, I can I can ask my colleagues who cover that. Okay, uh, Lauren. Yeah, hi, I'm Lauren Gibbons. I'm with M Live in Michigan, and I saw um, I saw on the website that uh, you have quite a bit of information here about uh, fines and fees and how local governments use those, and that's been a conversation, especially in the criminal justice realm that Michigan has been having quite a bit recently. And I just wanted to see if you could go into um, some of the best practices a little bit more, um, because especially when it comes to, you know, whether uh, local governments are currently using these as kind of revenue raising sources um, when there's a lot of other pressures on, on local governments right now. Yeah, so that's actually, so that fines and fees, that report was actually just released uh, mid, Point of last year. So that's something that's still fairly new as far as how they were talking about the subject. Uh, what I can say, at least at this point, um, you know, that's at least in the coming year, um, we're working on what will likely be our next president's initiative, um, slightly related to this, but uh, putting an equity lens in budgeting. Um, so those are some of the, some of the topics I know that have um, are, are potentially going to be discussed and addressed. We just released a paper this week on on uh, police budgeting. Um, that, of course, is also something that you know really at the end of the day for our finance officers because they're not like the elected officials trying to take a much more um, uh, I, I don't want to say a measured approach, but you know really just looking at the numbers and how to engage the community better. Um, and then figuring out how to best allocate the resources. So uh, as far as, you know, some of the stuff that, that the, the fines and fees uh, uh, is getting at and how, you know, the impact that could have on particular segments of the community, um, you know, that's really something that is, that, that discussion is actually something that is uh, not new per se, but new as far as what GFOA is doing, trying to do. So I wouldn't think that, you know, I wouldn't say that we have, we, we fully developed, you know, best practice out of that, but, or at least at this point, because it's still fairly new. Okay. And you said, you mentioned your, your, your new president, you mean the, the incoming, the president elect? Uh, yes. President, uh, yeah. Um, and he's uh, from, as I remember, Michael. he's from Mecklen Mecklenburg County in North Carolina, right? Right. Michael Bryant. So we have, we have one North Carolina fellow in here. Um, and the outgoing president is from St. Louis, and we have one St. Louis reporter in here. Yeah. 
Um, and last question to uh, Anna. Hi, um, I'm not sure if uh, you'd be able to help with this, but uh, hopefully you can. There's this new, um, a new voucher bill in Florida that will be a huge, huge overhaul of how about state um, taxpayer back vouchers are included in the state budget. They want to create this new trust fund called the K-12 trust fund, where there's an infusion of general revenue plus corporate donations and they can get tax credits. And there's this it's like, a, I think it's a 6.6 .6 billion cost over five years, but because you're mixing tax credits and all these different formulas, it's really difficult to really figure out whether it's constitutional or not, or how to even track what's going on. Um, and I don't know if there's other states that handle vouchers through general revenue. And I don't know, how, how does the state handle that? With best practices. <laughs> well, that is a, definitely a good question. Can I? Can, uh, I Florida. I, I work for the Miami Herald, um, so this is they're doing this in Tallahassee, in Florida. Um, what if I don't know, Chris? If you shared my email, but I'd love to follow up on this because I, I haven't yeah. seen what that bill is, but I, I'd be curious to get a better understanding of what it is trying to. Yeah, do. they just created the trust fund yesterday, so oh, okay. <laughs> really new. Yeah, so Anna should have um, have your email so you two can you know touch base afterwards. I think that could be. Yeah. I'll send you an email. Okay. Oh, that'd be great. Yeah, I'd love to hear more about that. But uh, based on what you described off the top of my head, I sounds like there's a lot going on there, and I'm, I'm not sure that I've you know I've heard that in other states. So. Okay. All right, and with that, it's uh, two o'clock, and Mike has another. Um, discussion he has to get to. So Mike, I wanna thank you very much for taking the time to uh, come talk with us.